Now we're in First Peter chapter number five and verses five to seven. The title of the sermon is "Clothe Yourself with Humility." The world tells us that to be satisfied, we need to we need fortune. We need to make a lot of money. In fact, uh, a, a boatload of money. The more money you make, the more famous you become. Society persuades us that to be significant, we need to have fame, be well known, to be connected. The culture tries to convince us that to have true success, we need influence and wield power, be in control, don't take orders, be your own man, give the orders to people. And if this big three of success doesn't do it, then the real secret lies in indulgence. Fulfilling your wants, your desires, your dreams, your pleasures. The world's methods of achieving uh, these things aren't difficult, right? What are they? Work hard. At least work harder than everyone else. Push ahead, even stepping on other people if it, if it needs to come to that. Removing all obstacles in the way of your success, whether that is friends, family, faith, whatever it is, promote yourself, even if it means exaggerating a bit. Anybody who's ever hired people on a resume probably understand that, right? Little bits of exaggeration. And the great irony of all of this is that the more success we have, the more we want. I saw this week the Walton family makes $70,000 every minute. I guarantee you, because they're human, they want more, right? The more we have, the more we want. History, experience, religion, psychology, sociology, all have taught us purposelessness. Pursuits can never ultimately quench our thirst for true meaning or to relieve our hunger for true happiness. Instead, fulfillment. In, uh, instead of fulfillment in these things, we experience a bloated nausea of disappointment. And in the end, the all-you-can-eat lifestyle leaves us weighed down in our spirit, nauseated with worry and let down by life. And we know that's to be absolutely true, isn't it? In an age like ours, it's countercultural to hear a message of humility. It's neither popular nor appreciated. At a time when looking good is considered more important than actually being good, uh, when the superficial impression makes a bigger splash than solid integrity, who has time for things like that we read today, submission, independence, and trust in our dog-eat-dog world, cut-in-line lifestyle, deferring to others looks stupid and even sounds silly, doesn't it? That's not the way of the world. And Peter is addressing the life of the church in what we just read. He he tells them how to shepherd the flock. He tells them to shepherd willingly, not being made to. He tells them to shepherd eagerly and not be greedy. And finally, he tells the elders to lead them by example and don't domineer over the church. And so we spent two weeks ago unpacking what it means for an elder to lead by shepherding, right? Well, that naturally leads to the question then, what is the responsibility of the flock? And that's where we find ourselves today in the next three verses. Verse number five says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, that gives grace to humble. Now, as I read that verse, I am so glad that Peter picked on younger men. By the way, that word younger is is masculine. He's talking about younger men. I'm so glad that that verse didn't read, likewise, you middle-aged men who like 80s music. So I'm off the hook completely. I don't have to pay any attention to this. But seriously, though, why did he pick... Younger men. Why do you say younger men? And I think it's because younger men tend to think that their ideas are the only ideas. Would you older men agree? Why, why do you agree? Because you were there. 
We were all there at one time. I, I remember. I got to go ahead and. I, I remember when I was uh, early 30s. I thought I knew everything there was about leading a church, and then I became a pastor, and I realized I didn't know anything. But you know, younger men think that uh, th- their ideas are the only ones, and they tend to disparage the ideas of the previous generation. And and you know, looking back at my life, I, I knew a lot more than I know now. I was impatient. I was headstrong, and because of, of these type of characteristics of younger men, um, young men tend not to want to submit, or they pick and choose the things with which they submit to. And so he says, younger men submit, be subject. That word, be subject, is a very interesting word. It's it's a word that's a it's a military word. It it literally means and and I would never tell a young guy this. I'll let Peter say it, okay? It literally means get in line. It's it's a it's a military term that says you're out of line, get in line. Get in line with the leadership. And so he's saying Everybody, particularly the headstrong young men, need to get in line under the authority of the elders and the shepherds. And it's a mark of spiritual maturity for a man or a woman to have an attitude of of submission. Um, submission is hard, though, isn't it? When you when you agree, submission's hard, and and, and it helps to remember this when, when we submit. Elders, according to the first verses of chapter five, they we have to give an account to God for the way that we led. I'm going to be honest with you, that's a little bit of a scary proposition. I remember when the church that I came from, we had a Sunday night service. And uh, one of the the issues that, that I felt like needed to be addressed was that we had these big services, but we didn't have a whole lot of fellowship. And so I wanted to make the trans... Um, translation or transfer into a small group type on Sunday nights as opposed to service. And I really, really wrestled with that because I had the people who loved the Sunday night service, both of them, um, <laughs> coming to me saying, this is ungodly, this is wrong, you're in, and so on and so forth. And I really had to wrestle through, okay, I- am I making a mistake? Am I going to give account for a really bad decision I made with a church. The, the the bottom line is that that change for that church was the best thing we could have ever done. It, it increased our fellowship so much with people praying together and, and, and things like that. But elders must give an account to God for the leadership. On the, on the other hand, church members give account to God for their submission. You see, so we're all giving account to God. It just depends on what. In my experience over the years in church ministry and seeing all different churches is when there is a disagreement with elders in a church, it's never doctrinal. It's always over a preference or a, a, a preferred thing or this is what I think we ought to do or so on and so forth. And, and most of the time when somebody doesn't submit to elders, it's over something that's just really a secondary thing. And so Peter says younger, likewise, the younger men submit, be subject to the elders. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit elders are not perfect. Uh, I have a great time. Who ain't in that? <laughs> Elders can also do church discipline, but that's another subject altogether. I can't believe somebody ain't in that. <laughs> Elders are not perfect, they make mistakes. But if you have a group of godly men in a church seeking the Lord's face, asking the Lord that His will be done, then you are called to submit to their leadership. Because when you submit to their leadership, realize that you're not really submitting to their leadership. Who are you submitting to? The God that is above them. You see how that works? And so ultimately, when you submit to an elder, you are actually submitting to God. Peter really meant for this attitude, though, to be for the whole church. Because look what he says. He says, 
Likewise, he, let me read it one more time. He says, likewise, you are younger, be subject to the elders. Then he says what? Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. And so the, not only are we supposed to be subject to the elders as believers, but we're also to be humble in all of our church relationships. We're to clothe ourselves with humility. By definition, the church is a gathering of the humble. You ever thought about that? Why do I say that? Because only the humble. What, when Jesus gave the, the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. It is only through humility that you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so by definition, the church is a gathering of the humble. We repent of our sin, we receive salvation, and it takes humility for us to live together in the body of Christ. And so he says, clothe yourselves with humility. Now, that is a very interesting term, that word clothe. The the picture, it, it means to tie an apron around yourself. Now, when we think apron, we always think kitchen. But when the Hebrews heard and saw this term, clothe yourself, talking about an apron, you know what they thought of? They thought of two groups of people. The first ones were slaves, and the second ones were shepherds. The two lowest classes of society. And Peter made this point and used, intentionally used that word to show us what kind of an attitude that we need to, to have in that clothing, that, that putting that apron on was done so that you would protect your clothing against the work that you're about to do. Now, we're very familiar with that image because it's in the Gospel of John during the last Passover. Do you remember when they walked into the upper room, none of the disciples wanted to wash the other's feet? And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that he tied his waist It was an apron of sorts that he put around his waist, taking on the form of a slave and humbly washing the feet of the very men that he created. I love that they read Philippians 2, right? About the humility of Jesus Christ. And so we are to clothe ourselves with humility. We're to, we're to be ready to spring into action for someone else in the church. I love this church. I've said this so many times, you're probably tired of me saying it. I love how they serve one another and how they love one another. And that's a sign of humility when you willingly will put aside yourself and, and your desires and what you want to do to serve someone else. Jesus met the needs of disciples, and humble people are people who will willingly meet the needs of others. Now, notice something about verse number 5. There's a logic. I want to show you the logic, because 5 and 6, I think when you see the logic, really brings out the impact of these two verses. Notice that there's a command. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. And then there's a reason. For God opposes the proud, and then there's a promise, but He gives grace to the humble. He gives a command, He gives a reason for His command, and then He gives a promise. And it's so easy for pride to creep into our relationships. You know, think about it. What what does pride look like in church relationships? Let me throw out some you may have never thought of. How about this one? Why didn't they include me? Is that pride? What about this one? Why didn't they tell me before they told everybody else? Why did I find out with everybody else? Pride's creeping in when you hear these kind of statements, when you think these. When, when, we, when, um, when we don't give up our seat for somebody else in the auditorium, I know that sounds silly. But it's, it's a form of pride. And so pride can creep in all over the place in, in our lives and we have to be watching for it. It's, it's like what Cheryl was t- talking about today. It's got roots and it's like a vine and it, it, it weaves itself in all of our relationships. But the one thing that we do know is as much as Cheryl hates those weeds, grass, whatever it is, God hates pride worse. Do you remember what the first sin was? 
it wasn't when Eve ate the fruit. The first sin was a cosmic rebellion in heaven. That when Satan lifted himself up in heaven and tried to overtake the throne of God, you say, Pastor, how do you know that? Well, there's two chapters in the Old Testament. Write these down if you want to know more about it. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, talking about the king of Tyre, uh, Tyre and Sidon, and, and that he's symbolic of Satan himself. And he says, I will exalt myself. I will be like the Most High. I will ascend. I will be over God's holy hill. Satan wanted the glory. Satan tried to steal the glory from God. The proud, those who are haughty and arrogant, thinking of themselves more important than everyone else, they trust in themselves while the humble trust in God. And God delights in being trusted. I was telling Heather this morning, uh, because of some stuff going on, I had such a hard time focusing this week on writing a sermon. I'm not going to lie to you. It was the hardest time since I've been here focusing on writing a sermon. And, And I just kept praying, Lord, help me, help me. And you know what God gave me this morning? This exact principle. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And it completely flipped my attitude this morning. All of a sudden I got excited thinking, okay, uh, what is God going to do today in the worship service? Because God delights in being trusted. He does not delight in our self-sufficiency. He doesn't delight in our intelligence, our success, or any of that because He gave it all to us. He delights in us humbly trusting in God. He delights in being trusted. The proud, they seek glory for themselves while the humble give glory to God. And the glory rightfully belongs to God, doesn't it? You don't want to be opposed to God, do you? I don't think anybody wants to be opposed to God. So we're to be humble in our relationships towards one another. But secondly, Peter says, we're to be humble in our relationship to God. Notice verse number six. There again is another command promise structure. I want to show it to you. It says this in verse number six. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And then the promise is so that at proper time he may exalt you. Now, I don't know about you. But if I'm going to be exalted by anyone, I want it to be by God. That's got to be the greatest exaltation there there is. But verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, what does that mean? To, To humble ourselves before God means that we will bow to his wisdom. We will accept the twists and turns of his providence. It means entrusting your concerns to Him. It it means that you will not fight God. Whatever He brings our way, we will accept it as from His hand. Now let me ask you, is that easy? That is not easy. Um, If I can be just a little bit uh, personal, Debbie's over here. Accepting the providential hand of God had to be one of the most difficult things I would imagine you ever experienced. And yet, humbly accepting that is, is the Bible says, will do what? He will exalt you. You see? Not being angry at God. Not fighting against God. But I want you to notice something. And I, I'm going to admit, in a way, I could make a shameless plug for you to be in, in our Old Testament survey class on Sunday mornings. And, okay, this is a shameless plug. But I want you to notice something. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under what? The mighty hand of God. Now, I don't think there are any Jewish people here. There might be. But if you have a Jewish background and you understand the Old Testament, then you understand something that's lost on probably most people that read it. We read that verse and say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and we move on. But for somebody who was steeped in Old Testament traditions, realize that there was a very significant little phrase that is from the Old Testament in there. And it's a little phrase, the mighty hand of God. This is a thoroughly Old Testament phrase, the mighty hand of God. It's it's um, Peter is referring back to God's greatest act of salvation. When 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 Old Testament authors 
refer to great, the greatest act of salvation in Israelite history. Where was that? The Exodus, wasn't it? And that's, that's exactly what is going on here. Peter is talking about a great act of salvation. Let's just consider this. And we'll see it in two weeks in Old Testament survey, by the way. Another shameless plug, if I can throw that in there. Moses is shepherding his father-in-law's flock. He sees this bush that's not burning. And God tells him that he wants to deliver the Israelites. And so in, in Exodus 3.19, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. And here's the Israelites. They're, they're enslaved. The Bible says that they're crying out to God. That the Egyptians are making their life bitter. That they're tired and weary. Does that sound like anybody here? Maybe you are tired and weary. Maybe your life is is bitter. And so they cried out to God and God sent Moses. And their salvation is repeatedly viewed as a rescue by God. Consider Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 21. This is Moses recapping everything at the end of the wilderness wanderings. And he says, Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a Mighty hand, again talking about salvation. And then Deuteronomy 26, verse number 8. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror and wonder. Nine times in Deuteronomy, the, 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 the Exodus is referred to as an act of God's mighty hand. But it doesn't stop there. It's all through the Old Testament. Daniel, who wrote one of the last books in the Old Testament, Daniel was alive during the 6th century B.C., He's talking about the salvation of Israel in Daniel 9. He says, and he's praying to God because it's close to the end of the Babylonian captivity. He says, now, O Lord God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Now, why would Peter stick that little phrase in there, mighty hand? Because Peter is writing to people who are being persecuted. They're tired. Their lives are bitter. They're weary. They, they might even be saying, God, I, I don't understand if I'm your son or I'm your daughter. Why is my life going this way? Why was I displaced from my home? Why am I in this foreign country? Why do people look at me with suspicion? And they're, they're, they're tired of it. And they're, they're wondering at it. And he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. No matter what his hand has brought to you, no matter what your trial is, no matter what your testing is, is after a time of testing and in In God's timing, He will deliver you out with a mighty hand. Isn't that, that's incredible. The Israelites, they, they had to be thinking to themselves, how long, O Lord, will you delay our deliverance? Have you ever thought that? Have you ever wondered that? Now, what's the promise? Because God's going to deliver at the proper time time. That's what that verse says. The proper time, look at the promise. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that at the proper time, He may exalt you. Can I give you a great theme of Scripture? Submitting to God always leads to exaltation. Submitting to God always leads to exaltation. Submitting to God doesn't look too attractive now, does it? Being humble doesn't even look too attractive now. But if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and we submit to Him, He will exalt us. The people that Peter is writing to, they're being persecuted, they're suffering, and all this sorts of thing. And He gives this promise at His time. Now, I submit to you that what He's talking about when He says, at proper time, is the coming to Jesus Christ. Because that's been the theme of the last half of Peter, is that there is a day coming, a day when Christ will come back. And when He comes back, whenever that happens to be, you will be exalted. Isn't that a wonderful promise? I'm an edgecomb. I've never been exalted at anything. I had a lot of fourth, uh, participation trophies. When, actually, I don't think they had participation cr- trophies when I was a kid. But I did have several third and fourth place trophies. Um, 
I'm looking forward to to that time. A fundamental building block of spiritual maturity is humility. When we fight God, we literally destroy our future. It's so, it's so important to remind ourselves that while you're under the mighty hand of God and He brings pressure against you to test you and to purge you and to purify you and you're suffering in very difficult circumstances, it's very important that you do not become discouraged. You're not to judge God or be unkind or unfair. You're to be humble. Now, if God's going to exalt you for being humble, I think the next question that we need to ask then is, Are you humble? That's a question I ask myself. And maybe you've never asked that question. I'm not going to ask how many has asked that question because probably the theme of most of us would be the old Mac Davis song, Oh Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble. I told you I could work that into the sermon, Heather. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about? Hard to be humble. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. Well, anyway, we won't continue, right? Uh, I ruined the spirit of this service already, but uh, let me give a marriage tip to young, young men real quick. You ready? If you really want to annoy your wife, learn the lyrics to that song and sing it to her. <laughs> Ask me how I know. So... <laughs> But seriously, if you ever, I was asking myself this week, Lord, am I really humble? I was also asking another question, Lord, show me where I'm not humble. The Puritans are a great help for us in this matter of humility, and and they're a great help to us in a lot of stuff because they were very good at taking Scripture and applying it to life. And Thomas Watson, the Puritan talked about humility, and he gave seven characteristics of true humility or seven evidences of true humility. I just want to run through these real quick with you. Number one, a person who is truly humble will be weaned of themselves. That's somebody who's, somebody who's poor in spirit. They will lose preoccupation with themselves. Self is nothing. Christ is everything. Which leads us right into number two. Humility will lead us to be lost in the wonder of Christ. You know, Second Corinthians 3.18 says, With unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, our satisfaction will be in the prospect of one day being fully in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Won't that be great? I was talking to a friend of mine on Friday, and we both were, were rejoicing in the fact. We said, won't it be great when we get to heaven and we will no longer be tempted? Won't it be great when we're like Jesus Christ and the temptation of sin is no longer there? And so we behold Christ. We're lost in the wonder of Christ. Number three, we will not complain about our situation no matter how bad it may become. Why? Because we know that we deserve worse than we than anything that we can experience in this life. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that you experience you deserve worse because you sinned against the Holy God than what you're experiencing now? I like the the, the quote, and I don't know who said it. I've heard it so many times. For the Christian, this life is the closest to hell we will ever experience. For the unbeliever, this is the closest to heaven they will ever experience. Now take your pick. Which one do you want? We we deserve worse than anything we can experience in this life. We will consider no circumstance to be unfair. When tragedy comes, we will not say, Why me, Lord? Our suffering is for Christ's sake. And not only will we not complain or feel ashamed, but we will glorify God in our suffering. We will know that we will also be glorified with Him and realizing that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. Amen? Number four. 
we will more clearly see the strengths and virtues of others as well as our own weaknesses and sins. When you see other people, do you see their virtues and their strengths or do you see their sins? Somebody who's truly humble realizes that, that, um, that I am weak and sinful and I don't deserve anything that I have. And you begin to see the virtues and we, we give preference to, to other people because we see virtues in them. Number five, we spend much time in prayer. I love this. This is what Thomas, let me quote Thomas Watson. This is what he said. Just as the physical beggar begs for physical sustenance, a spiritual beggar begs for spiritual sustenance. And we are all spiritual beggars, aren't we? We will knock often at heaven's gates because we're always in need. Like Jacob wrestling with the angel, we will not let go until we are blessed. Number six, We will take Christ on His terms, not on our own terms or any other. We will not try to have Christ while keeping our pride, our pleasure, or our covetousness, or our immorality. We will not modify His standards by religion, by tradition, but or by our own inclinations or persuasions. His Word alone will be our standard. And then number seven, we, when we are poor in the Spirit, we will praise God and thank Him for His grace. Nothing characterizes the humble more than abounding gratitude towards the Lord and His Savior. He knows that He has no blessings, no happiness, but that which the Father gives in love and grace. And He knows that God's grace is more abundant with faith and love which are found in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 14. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? That's what a humble person looks like. And let me ask you something. Are you humble? I want to close with a promise. Look at what He says in verse number 7. And that's the last thing that we need to do in our congregational relationships. Throw yourself to the care of God. Look at verse number 7. What does it look like to humble yourself into God's mighty hand? Verse number 7, well, let me say this before I read it. In the language structure of the verses, he says, humble yourself into God's mighty hand. And then verse number 7 is a participle describing what that looks like. What does it look like to humble yourself? Look at what he says. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That's what it looks like to be humble. You might be saying to yourself, um, well, well, why does he say that? Well, he's, he's literally using the term when he says throw, it's like a blanket. You know how you throw a blanket on a donkey and then throw the saddle on it? Um, that, that's, that's the idea here. You're throwing your cares upon God. Throw it on God. All the discontent, all the discouragement, all the despair, the questioning, the wondering, the the pain, the suffering that you're going through, just give it to Him. Turn it in for trust in God who really cares for you. And so when you look at the inverse, if casting your worry upon the Lord is humility, then what is worry? Pride. You see the difference? Worry is pride. Now, I know what some of you are saying. Yeah, Pastor, you can't be. I'm really worried right now, and I don't feel proud at all. Well, believers humble themselves by casting worries on God. If we continue to worry, then we're, con- we're caving into pride because worry is a form of pride. Because believers filled with anxiety, they're convinced that they must solve all their problems. And their lives are need to be fixed in their own strength. The only God that they trust in is themselves. But when believers take their worries and they cast them upon God, they express their trust in His mighty hand, acknowledging that He is the Lord and Sovereign over all of life. The German theologian, last name Gopelt, said this, Affliction neither drives one into the arms of God, nor severs one. I'm sorry, I misread that. Affliction either drives one into the arms of God or severs one from God. Now listen to me. I want to close with this. God cares for you. 
You can cast all your anxieties on Him. I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, anxiety-wise. I just know that you can cast that anxiety upon God. It could be a child's salvation. It could be a job situation. It could be, it, it, it could be um, maybe a, a, a bad doctor's visit. I don't know what your anxiety is. It could be any host of, of a number of things. But I know this. God is honored and wants you to cast your cares, your anxieties upon Him because there is no one that cares about you more than God. And when you do that, and when you humbly submit to Him, and when you humbly su- submit, you're humble in your relationships to one another, and you submit to the leadership of the church, God said that at the proper time, He will exalt you. O oh, Christian, full of care and anxiety. O oh, Christian, full of, of um, anxious relationships and, and, so, and all these other things, throw your care upon God. He cares for you more than you care for even your own children. Bottom line, He can do more than any one of us can. Lord, I thank You that we can trust Your sovereign care. That we don't carry our burdens alone. I thank You that You tell us, Lord, that if we're just humble in our relationships with one another, we, we give preference to others. We quit thinking about ourselves and magne- uh, just, uh, just bask in the awe and wonder and glory of Jesus Christ and make Him everything. And if we'll submit to the leadership that You place in the church, Lord, You tell us that You will exalt us. What a, what a wonderful day that will be when Jesus comes in all His glory. And we go from being the, the ones who are overlooked, who are viewed as being weird, viewed as being the ones who are disrupting the progress of society. We will go from that to being lifted up in glory and exaltation and magnified not for our own glory, but for the glory of Jesus Christ who made all this possible. Lord, make us a humble people dependent upon You for everything. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.